This morning, I want to enter into a two-week, not really a two-week, because this is really one week before Christmas, almost like an Advent lead-up sermon, uh, two-part sermon leading into Christmas uh, with us as a community, and kind of talk about some of these things and examine some of them as a church and talk about uh, what is really happening in the birth story, um, because it can almost feel a little mundane, like you've heard it, but what is God trying to teach us? What is he leading? I was sharing with our team, one of the things I prayed about as I was going into this, uh, this week um, and these two sermons was, what is God trying to tell us right now in the present? Like, what do we need from this story right now? What are, there's some truths that are, that, that stand, that, that are timeless, but what is God trying to speak to us with the birth of his son? And so, uh, you know, I, I believe God is, is giving us truth, and I believe he's going to reveal some things. But uh, as we move into this Holy Week as a church, I think it is a good reminder that God is still working, that Jesus, even though it was thousands of years ago, then we reflect on his birth. There are truths that he is doing. There are things that are happening and that there is peace specifically, even in the midst of the chaos. Maybe, maybe for some of you, Christmas is very peaceful. For my wife, like Christmas is her jam. She looks forward to it all year. She preps for it. She has like a, a plan. It's like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone when he rolls out the, my wife has a plan going into Christmas. She is ready to do some things. And, uh, maybe for you, Christmas is just peaceful and exciting and, and, and you, you anticipate it. But for others of you, maybe Christmas and the holidays, maybe once Thanksgiving hits, it feels like nothing but chaos. Uh, that, that was me growing up. I was talking with my brother this week and he's staying in California for Christmas and we're staying here. It's kind of the first Christmas. We're all kind of staying put and just spending Christmas with our families together. And uh, we told everyone, if you want to celebrate, you got to come to us because because we're going to just hang out. We're going to just be together. But I was laughing with my brother because growing up, we always went to my grandma Lutz's house on Christmas night. It was what everybody did. And we showed up and all the cousins and extended family, everybody went to her house. And, and let me tell you, it was great because a lot of families don't do that anymore, but it was mad chaos. We were talking about it. Everyone has these great memories of being together, but the memories that I have were like, we were all together, but there were just people everywhere. You would have all the old men down in the den, right, with the TV on, and they'd be talking about the good old days and doing all the things. And then, like, there would be a group up in the living room, and then, you know, you'd have the older kids in this area, and then us younger kids, we were in the, we got shoved to the basement. How many know that's where you shove the younger kids? You get put in the basement because y'all are too rowdy. That was us. And so it was, it was Lord of the Flies in the basement. If you came down there, we were, we were twisting ankles, Royal Rumble wrestling, you threw cushions in the middle, and everybody just went at it. And so it was fun. They were good memories. But when I think back, it was just people everywhere. It would be kind of chaotic. And for some of you, Christmas kind of feels like that, where it's just like everything everywhere. You have to travel to this place and do this thing. And it feels like the holidays are just a marathon of chaos. That's how life can kind of feel sometimes. And I've, I've been thinking about the, the story of Jesus and his birth and in this story that we reflect on every year. And I was, I was joking with someone this week because as a pastor, uh, for like almost the last 20 years, I've given Christmas sermons. And I was joking saying, how do you give another Christmas sermon and make it still interesting when you've preached the same story so many times? And so that was my prayer going into this was, God, can you reveal something? Can you give us something that, that will help us uh, better under, understand you, but also be a message for us as we enter into this holiday season? And so for the last uh, couple of weeks, I've been thinking about two powerful themes that we're going to address over the next few weeks. And this morning, I want to talk about the idea of peace. 
I want to talk about the subject of peace. And if and, and for some of you, you feel that peace. For others, you don't. And as, as we're leading in, as I've been reading this story and just asking God to speak to me, I don't know if you've been joining us on, on Facebook. We've been posting every day a reflection verse, an Advent verse for the last month. Every, every day there's a passage that you can kind of read and pray about and ask God to speak to you. But as I've been living in this story for the last couple of weeks and kind of asking God to speak, there were two things he kept bringing up over and over again with me. The idea of peace and community. And so this morning I want to talk about peace and I want to talk about the story of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Luke. But I want to set us up this morning. I want to set up what God is, is trying to speak to us. The, the Gospels are interesting because every story has a different account of, of Jesus' birth. Mark just kind of blitzes through it. He's like, Jesus is born. Let's just get to the good stuff, right? He goes right into the miracles and all the stuff happening, and he just kind of rolls through the story. And so this, this story, as I, as I set up the book of Luke, this story isn't just a feel-good story. It isn't just to make us feel great and happy. Um, and, and if we're being honest, uh, this story actually can feel a bit chaotic. See, it's interesting we read the story of Jesus' birth as this great thing, and we have Christmas, but it is deeply connected to his crucifixion and the gospel and what's taking place. And so leading up to the story, you have a couple things happen. The first thing that happens, starting back in the Old Testament, you have all the prophets, and they've been prophesying that the Messiah is coming, we are going to get rescued, he's going to come, he's going to conquer the, the, the enemy that is over top of you, is Israel, you will be freed. And so everybody has been anticipating this Messiah to come. And then what happens is, is for 400 years, no one hears anything. The era of the prophets ends. The prophets go silent. God goes silent. For 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament, there is not a word. God does not speak. He doesn't send any more prophets. It is just oh, what feels like nothing. See, here's the thing. As I, as I studied that 400 years and I read some scholars and people that are far brighter than I am, and I tried to understand what was God doing? Was he angry? What was he speaking? See, God doesn't reveal anything new and he doesn't say anything. It's known as the silent years. And it's easy to look at that and say God was punishing. But what I believe after, after looking into it, what God is really doing is he is preparing and that's a good message for some of you. You might feel like God isn't doing anything right now, but maybe God is preparing something within you for what he is about to give you. I think a lot of times we get caught up in the silence and we get discouraged, but what if we viewed it as more of a preparation, as conditioning, as God molding some things into us. And, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And so God is silent. And then after 400 years, there's a little girl in a small town. And I say little girl because Mary was probably between 12 and 14 when this story takes place. Some of you are like, whoa. But that was normal in their day that people were married a lot younger. They were married at a different time. And so after 400 years, the story picks up with a young girl in a small town of Nazareth in Galilee. And out of nowhere, uh, this, this Jewish girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph is basically surprised by an angel. And an angel shows up and says, surprise, you're pregnant. And we read it like, oh, how beautiful. God shows up and gives her a child. But imagine being 13 years old and an angel shows up and you're engaged. And in Jewish law, if you had relations outside of wedlock, you could literally be dragged into the town square and stoned to death. 
And you have to go to your family and friends and say, an angel told me I was pregnant with the Son of God and watch what people looked at you like. And we know this because we see how Joseph responds to Mary to the point where Joseph uh, tries to leave her and break off the engagement because he doesn't want to be shamed by what's taking place. And this is how the story of Jesus begins. It doesn't feel very peaceful, does it? It's a bit chaotic. And, and so finally Joseph comes around and, and God and the angel shows up and they both get on the same page. But now as Mary is pregnant, they find out they have to travel because they are under Roman rule. And so as Mary is at the end of her pregnancy, they have to get on a donkey or a mule or however, and they have to travel to Bethlehem because that's where Joseph's family was from. And they had to return there for a census. I've never been pregnant, but I have been married to a woman who has been pregnant. If I told Lauren at the end of her pregnancy, you have to get on a donkey and we have to go on a journey, I'd probably get hit in the head. That does not sound like a good time, but they are faithful and they get on the donkey and they travel. It doesn't feel very peaceful, does it? I, 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 what I'm trying to paint is a true picture of what's taking place because we have our nativity scenes and we do our plays and we watch our movies and everything and we got Silent Night playing and we sing it, Oh Holy Night. But, but I would imagine leading up to the birth, Mary and Joseph are very stressed out. Everything feels like chaos. Yet they get to Bethlehem and when they show up in Bethlehem, they find out there's so many people there, there's nowhere to stay. You know the story. And so they have to stay in a barn. And, and I just wonder, I wish I could have been one of those animals in the barn listening to the conversation that was taking place between Mary and Joseph. Like, are you kidding me? I have to stay out here. I'm in labor. What are we doing? And, 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 and I Guarantee it is not as pretty as the pictures that we read in books. Because they were human. Even if you knew God told you, you, you are still dealing with very real things and there's no medicine, there's not, you are just in a barn, in labor, about to have a child. And then Jesus shows up. And we think, now the story is going to get peaceful. Now it's going to get better. And I believe there is a message here and I'm going to unpack it, but I still want to set up what's happening. They get to this moment and they think, now we can take a breath. And what happens? The Jewish king rises up, Herod. Herod the Great, who they actually called King of the Jews. So it's symbolic when Jesus is called King of the Jews. It's symbolic to Herod the Great, who was the Jewish king at the time and finds out there's going to be a savior, the King of the Jews. And he says, no way, that is my title. And so he orders to find Jesus to kill him. Even after the birth, chaos is still happening but there's a message in the midst of it. You're like, Brent, this isn't very hopeful. This is Christmas. You're supposed to be encouraging us. There, there is a hopeful and peaceful message. I promise you, just stay with me and, and I'll unpack it. And, and so these are the words shouted when Jesus is born and the angels are singing as Mary and Joseph are in the midst of what feels like chaos. This is the message the angels give. Luke chapter two, verse 10. The shepherds are in the fields. The angels show up and they say, don't be afraid. I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by the vast host of the heavens, the armies of heaven, praising and saying this. This is the message the heavens are giving to earth in the midst of the chaos. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Now I've read this passage a million times. I've preached on it. But I've never connected the scene that is taking place to the message that is given from heaven. 
Because we just think, like, this is just a joyous moment. But, but there is a tension in the midst of it. And I think it's good news for us because for a lot of us, we feel in the tension of Christmas and our reality. We know there's hope and peace. We have all the signs and all the stuff. And, and we see the Christmas trees and there's joy. Yet we feel the tension of what our reality is at Christmas versus what is being shouted from heaven to us. And I believe there's a message of hope for us this morning. And, and, and I believe there's a powerful message in how Jesus is announced to humanity. See, even if you feel that tension, even if you live in the midst of it, and, and trust me, I'm there, I've been there, I've, I've walked through it, there are times where I'm in it, there's times where I'm not, and maybe you're the same. But, but even if you feel that tension at our core, at the core of who we are, deep in our soul, if you strip away the brokenness and the hurt and all the things, at our core, we all have a deep desire for peace. Every single one of you, every person in this room, we all desire peace. You ever been in a loud house and you just want what? Peace and quiet. You just want to sit in it because our soul cries out for peace. We were not made to live in chaos. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and they walked with Jesus, what does the book of Genesis say there was? There was peace with God. And so chaos is a result of sin. It's a result of brokenness. It's a result of the earth. But, but, and so we tend to focus in on our chaos rather than the peace our soul desires. And so in a, in a, in a desperate effort to find peace in our lives, we begin to fill our lives with things. And I watch it all the time. I do it all the time. What do we do when we, we don't feel peace? We, we begin to grab for things. And so you begin to grab for money, right? Money will bring me peace. Or a relationship will bring me peace, right? Like, you ever gone into a, let, let me give you some free 30-second marriage counseling advice. If you are getting married because you think your spouse is going to bring you peace, you are going to be let down. If you're getting married and your motivation is this person is going to fix what is broken within me, I promise you, you are going to be let down because Jesus is the only thing that is going to fix the brokenness within you. And I think so often we grab a hold of things and then, and then we get a year into marriage or we get months into marriage or maybe a week into marriage and we wonder why it's not fixed. It's because... All the things you're grabbing for to bring you peace are not from the Lord. It isn't what God intended. And so we begin to grab things to fill this deep desire. And we find momentary peace, but it's not the peace our soul is craving. Paul says this in Romans 8, verse 6. He says, set, for to set the mind on flesh... What he's saying is to set your mind on the things you want to grab for, the things that you think will fill you up, is death. But to set your mind on the Spirit brings life and peace. What he's, what he's teaching us is this idea. All the things we grab for, all the things we think that are going to fill us up and make us feel good, it, it, it will only lead to more brokenness. But when we grab a hold of the Spirit of God, when we grab a hold of Christ, when we let his presence fill us, that is where we find true peace. See, if our soul is desired to be connected back to the vine, which is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the, he is the vine, we are the branches. And he, he gives this analogy of us being connected to the vine. If our soul desires to be connected, whether you believe it or not, your soul is craving Jesus. Why? Because he made you in his image. You are made in the image of God. You were not made to be disconnected from God. What it, what, sin came and broke us apart, but our souls desire to be connected back to the Father. And if we desire to be connected to the vine, the Father, and that is where we find life, then that is where we find peace. That is what Paul is teaching us. 
But the things we fill our life with, they, they almost, we think they're going to bring us closer, but they end up separating us more. That's why Jesus taught things like he is living water. He is the source of life. He is the vine because he is desperately trying to get us to strip away all the things that end up keeping us far away and for us to connect back to him. And so when Jesus comes forth on earth, he doesn't just begin bringing peace at age 33. You know, he doesn't just begin bringing peace when he enters ministry. He, we, we don't just skip over all these years. It, it, he, he begins to bring peace from the moment he is brought on to the earth. Jesus' birth is the gospel being unleashed. It's the hope being given to us. And, and I know this seems, you're like, Brent, I know this, but do you really, do you focus on it? Because I've, I've preached on this a million times, church. Let me tell you, I've preached on this story more times than I've preached on anything. And I think how often in my life, even now, at almost 40 years old, do I feel like I'm in chaos and what do I do? Uh, my first reaction, unfortunately, is not to go to the vine. It's to go to earthly things. Because our sin is trying to separate us, but God is desperately pulling us in. And, and when we grab a hold of the gospel, there's hope, even in the midst of the chaos. And so this amazing gift is unleashed on humanity in this moment in a manger in Bethlehem. And you think there should be life. Yet there's still chaos unfolding around them. So why? Why is this important? Why is how this story, why is this how God chose to send his son? And I believe he's trying to teach us how to get to the source of our peace. See, sometimes, and this is important, and this is hard. This is going to be a hard truth. It's a hard truth for me. But, but it's important to understand. See, I believe sometimes, a lot of times, I'm not going to say all the time, but I think sometimes the chaos exposes the value of the gift of peace. Why, why would there still be chaos if God wants us to have peace, if he wants us to be connected? Uh, because we're broken, because we're sinful. So I think sometimes the chaos is actually to help expose the gift of peace. There's a movie. Anybody ever seen the movie A Knight's Tale? You know I'm going to talk about movies. I do it all the time. I love movies. There's a movie called A Knight's Tale. And uh, Jeffrey Chaucer, who's a real person, is fictitious in the movie. But there's a scene and a line from the movie that has always stuck with me. He's giving this, like, speech to announce Sir Ulrich. And he's, like, being really flowery. He's, like, he saved a virgin from her cruel per And he's, like, doing all this stuff to hype him up, right? He's a good hype person. But he says this line that has, like, been imprinted in my brain ever since I saw the movie. He says this. He says, in Greece, he spent a year in silence just to better understand a whisper. He says he sat in silence just so he could understand a whisper. What he's saying is he, he, he had to do without. He had to sit in, in the quiet just to hear the small whisper. And that stuck with me. And I think, and I want you to think about this idea for a second, that, that what if we live in the chaos? What if because of our brokenness, now hear me, I'm not saying God desires for your life to be chaotic. Do not twist it. But I'm saying we are all broken. We are all sinful. We are only made whole because of Jesus. And until we enter his glory one day, we have this battle between flesh and spirit. Paul talks about it in the New Testament over and over again. You are torn between two worlds. Your flesh is trying to pull you away from God. Your spirit is trying to stay connected. So what if we need to live in the chaos sometimes just to appreciate the peace? It's a, it's a paradigm shift. It's a, it's a shift in your mentality that like, I, I don't want to be here, but maybe we need to walk through it just to appreciate it. I think so often in my life, how, how like I've been in seasons where it's been burdenful, where I felt like God isn't moving the 400 years of silence. 
And you feel like nothing's happening, but, but God is actually teaching me even in the midst of those moments. I've been, I've been living in some of those seasons recently. And I'm saying, God, what are you trying to teach me? Because I don't see it right now. But if I believe he's good and I believe he's sovereign because that's what his word says, then I know he's going to first carry me through. And I know there's a testimony on the other side. And so what if when we're in chaos, what if, it's, what if it is really to expose the peace so we can appreciate his goodness? This is what he did in the 400 years of silence. He wasn't punishing, but he was preparing them to slow down, to quit listening to prophets and begin to look for him. Because when Jesus shows up, if they were looking to Isaiah or Malachi or all these people, would they really be ready for Jesus? We know this because we see what happens with John the Baptist. People were divided. Do we follow John? Do we follow Jesus? And John, because he was faithful, always pointed people to Christ. And so the preparation was the silence. And what if in your life you need to shift your mindset on the chaos and say, what is God trying to strip away? What is God trying to teach me? I shared that, that we've never been home on Christmas. We've always been, but this year, it's been painful to tell people, like, we're not coming to see you. This is how it is. But, but what God has been teaching us is to value our family, to value togetherness. Because if we don't stop and slow down, the years will just pass us by. And so what if God is, is speaking in the midst of your chaos because he's trying to peel things away and say, this is what you feel, feel, fill your life with. This is what you supplement peace with. And if you strip it all away, you can get back to that manger. It's a preparation. It's preparing us. And here's the truth I want you to take away this morning. How do you live? How do we walk through the chaos? How do we find peace this holiday season? How, how do we get there? And, and this is what I want you to understand. And this is what God really has been revealing to me, specifically me this season. Sometimes I get up and I feel like I'm just preaching to myself. But how do we find peace? How do we get peace? How do we get back here? And this is what God's been teaching me. The birth of Jesus is a covenant moment. We think of covenants like when the ark settles and, Jesus, and God sends the rainbow. We think of covenants like uh, Joseph at, the, at his altar where he wrestled with God. We think of all these covenant moments, a marriage ceremony. But the birth of Jesus is actually a covenant moment between God and humanity. When Jesus is born and the heavens un unleash on earth and, and God's presence is unleashed in human form on this earth. It is a covenant moment between God and humanity. And more specifically, it's a covenant of peace. It's a gift to us. It's not just a reminder that, yeah, it's Jesus and it feels good and it's a savior, but it's his, his birth is a reminder that even after 400 years of silence, even after the exiles in the Old Testament, even after the, the, the Jews being enslaved and all the kings and all the crookedness and all the way back to the garden where humanity breaks itself away from God and sin enters the world, it is a reminder when Jesus is born, it is a covenant of peace on this earth. We know this because of the book of Isaiah, if you want to turn there. Isaiah 57. As I was studying, what the angels shout out in the book of Luke is actually an echo from a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. If you go to Isaiah 57, this is what Isaiah is giving to the people of Israel as he's prophesying for the Messiah. This is what he says. He says, God says, rebuild the road, clear away the rocks and stones so that my people can return from captivity. It's the same idea that I was just talking about, stripping away the things that are filling your life, holding you from connecting to the vine. Isaiah is saying it right here. He says, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this. I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit. 
This is deeply connected to the birth of Jesus. He says, I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those who repent with their hearts. For I will not fight against you forever. I will not always be angry. Remember, Israel's in exile. They keep turning their heart away from God. They're filling their life with the wrong things. God is desperately trying to connect them back. He says, I will not always be angry. If I were, all people would pass away. Do you see the connection between Jesus' birth and this moment? God didn't have to send his son. God didn't have to send Jesus. God could start over at any moment, yet he loves us. That he sent Jesus and he said, he said, if I were, all people would pass away. All the souls I have made, I was, all the souls I have made, I was angry, so I punished these greedy people. I withdrew from them, but they kept going on their own stubborn way. God says, I have seen what they do, but I will heal them anyway. God is not surprised. God sees you even in your chaos, and he desires for you to be connected. He says, I will lead them. I will comfort those who mourn, bringing words of praise to their lips. That's the part I want you to catch. May they have abundant peace, both near and far, says the Lord, who heals them. But those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says God. Do you see the connection between Isaiah's words and what is taking place in that manger? Because God in his infinite wisdom is desiring for us to get back to this moment. In Luke 2, he, he is echoing when the, when the heavens unleash and, and, and they say, glory to God, peace on earth. What they're saying is, is this is your moment. God has not abandoned you. I know he's been silent. I know it's been chaotic. I know it feels messy. But I am present. I am here in the midst. It's a declaration, but even more so, it's a promise. It's a covenant moment for us. And I think if we begin to look at the birth of Jesus like a covenant, it has it is really changed my approach to Christmas this year and my approach to this whole story because it's not just this story. It is good news and it's all the things, but it's good news because it's a promise to us. We don't have to get all the way to the cross to realize the promise because Jesus is doing it in that manger. Jesus is the gift. He is the Prince of peace. It's literally one of his names. He's the source of peace. It's the promise of peace. And here's what I believe, church. And this is what I want you to get this morning. As I've looked through scripture and I've looked at Jesus' story, everything Jesus touches, and this is what I was alluding to at the beginning, there's chaos happening, but what do we see over and over again? From the point the angel says you are pregnant with Jesus, what did Mary have even in the midst of the turmoil? Even as Joseph was ready to leave her, even as, as everybody was questioning, what did Mary have? She had an unwavering peace. Because everything Jesus touches brings peace. Even in the midst of, the, of the, the barn, even in the midst of the stable, as, as you would think it would be crazy, everything Jesus touches, there is peace. Even as Herod rises up and they have to once again pack up and run away and flee for their lives, they still have what? Peace. And how often do we forget to let Jesus come into our situation to bring us peace? Because we want to be in control. I look through Jesus' life. And I think even with the shepherd and the wise men, 
when they come into Jesus' presence, they find peace. Even as Jesus gets older and later in life, and I think about the miracles, what happens when the woman is caught in adultery? And she's thrown before the temple, and, and Jesus kneels down with her. I believe she found peace in that moment. When the woman who was bleeding for years and all she wants to do is touch the hem of Jesus' garment and people are trying to keep her away, what happens in that moment when she touches his garment and he, his attention shifts to her? What does she find? She finds healing, but she finds peace. Even at the end, when Jesus is next to the well and the woman who had been with many men and she's looking for water, and Jesus says, I'm living water, right? As he's standing there, and he's, he's really giving her a message of the gospel. But, but what is she met with for the first time in that moment when she is in the presence of Jesus? It's peace. And even in his crucifixion and resurrection, there's unwavering peace. Do you see the connection do you see the message for us today? It, it, I mean, it has been so powerful in my life. There is peace that always follows Jesus if we can just tap into the source. It's what Isaiah promises us. He says there's no peace if you keep filling your life with the wrong things, but if you get to his presence, you will find peace. And so here's my question as we move into this Christmas week. It's a question I've been asking myself. My question for you as we go into Christmas, maybe you're like me. Maybe this, this time of year feels chaotic. Maybe you've been in a chaotic season. I want to make sure I use that word right because I don't think God puts us in chaos forever. I think we walk through chaotic seasons. But there's always faithfulness on the other side. Maybe you've been in the midst of it. Maybe life feels chaotic. What are you tapping into to find your peace? Maybe right now there's things in front of you and, and you're faced with it and maybe there's some family situations and drama and, and things feel really messy. Are, are, are you trying to find peace by taking control for yourself, by trying to take things into your own hand? Or are you getting to the manger? Are you tapping into the presence of Jesus, the Prince of Peace? Are you getting into his presence? Are you inviting the covenant of peace into your life, into your situation? I know for me, my, my immediate reaction when I'm in chaos is to shut down, to hide away. I can fix this after I shut down and everyone leaves me alone. And what Jesus is saying, yeah, walk through what you need to, but, but, but get into my presence. Understand what I have done. Understand my love for you. Jesus is inviting us into a place of peace. Why don't you stand with me this morning? I can guarantee that some of you are in the midst of situations right now. Some of you are facing mountains. Some of you are facing trials. Some of you, you're like, Brent, I don't want to hear about peace right now because I don't feel it. There's no better place to be. Maybe the Holy Spirit is working some things in your heart and he's inviting you into this covenant of peace, into this situation. See, the gospel is an invitation into peace. That's why Jesus does it. That's why Jesus pays a, a violent death so that we can find peace in God's presence, so that we can be reconciled back to him. The cross is an invitation into peace. And so this morning, we're going to end like this. There's no band up here. It's going to feel weird. It's going to be different. And uh, for some of you, you're going to hate it and feel uncomfortable, but I don't care. <laughs> we do communion every week. We get together in groups, and this is what I want you to do. We're going to put on some music as we wrap up. We're going to take communion, and we're going to remember the birth and the resurrection because they are connected together. We're going to thank God that he saved us. We're going to thank God that we are saved because of his son, but we're also going to remember this morning 
the covenant that takes place in Bethlehem. The covenant of peace that God has given us. And this is what I want you to do as you get into huddles and find people, don't, no one be left alone. I want you to ask specifically. Maybe people don't, we don't need to force it, but if you're facing a situation where you need peace, you need the presence of Jesus. You need him to show up as we go into this Christmas season. I want you, I want you all to pray for each other. I want us to get around each other and, and invite peace into our Christmas season. Because what better testimony than the people of God to walk in peace and joy and hope into Christmas? Because we have the reason to be joyful. The reason for the season, right? People don't say that anymore, but they should. We have the source. And so as you prepare communion, if you need to grab it in the back, you can. I want you to do that. I want you to get together. I want you to, I want you to take communion. Thank God for, for Jesus, his birth, his resurrection. But I want you to ask specifically to one another, where do you need peace this season? And let's encourage one another in prayer. And then I'll come back up and close.